All right, students, it's time to start talking about color. And today's slideshow is going to be a little bit long. So if you want to take breaks, be sure, you know, just pause it and um, take breaks in between. But there's a lot to talk about. And first of all, let me just say that there's a couple of disclaimers. Uh, the best way of learning color is in practice. You need to become a mad scientist and, you know, mix your paints. Painting is the best way to do that. Uh, you can learn all you can about, you know, color theory and, and everything else, but those little things will help you, but ultimately it's going to be you putting this into practice. So keep that in mind. Don't be afraid. Just get in there and start trying different things and you'll find things that will work for you really well. And my other disclaimer is that before we start talking about color is we talk about value or the value of color, which is referred to as tone. Now, just like our last assignment, which was just a monochromatic painting in black and white, um, color paintings need to also be realized in their sense of tonal value. You have to try to match the lightness and darkness of things for them to look well. It's to get that tonal balance, that value balance in your image. So color is great, but remember contrast, um, light and dark, value, those things are is equally or more important in a lot of regards than color itself. All right, so to begin, let's talk about very basic subtractive color mixing theories. Um, and the idea of the color wheel you have to be aware of. You can download one of these from, from this uh, discussion forum if you wish, if you want to have one physically in your house. Um, but the idea between, or the idea of subtractive color mixing is you start with three primary colors, colors that can only be found in the natural world. So pigments such as blue have to be found in the natural world, yellow or red. Those are the three primary colors and no other colors can be mixed to make, make those. And the first set of colors that are made once you've mixed those, yellow and red make orange, yellow and blue make green, and blue and red make purple. Those are the secondary colors. Okay, and then of course there's variations and subtle, you know, shifts in color all the way around this wheel. There can be a slightly bluish purple, there can be a reddish orange, you know, greenish yellow. All those things are going to be things that you'll you'll need to start picking up on and trying to to observe. And one of the fascinating things about this, and we'll talk about this first because, I don't know, it's, it's kind of exciting. It's not the only thing to know about, but it is a, a cool trick that will help benefit your paintings in the long run to understand this, is the idea between about complementary colors. Now, those are colors that happen opposite each other on the color wheel. So the opposite of green on the color wheel is red. The opposite of blue is orange, and the opposite of purple is yellow. It's really important to remember those because they have a lot of useful benefits. For one, they act almost like an acid and a base. They're very strongly opposed from one another. Uh, seen by side and side, they're almost violently visually exciting. They're electric. They, they really make each other pop. So much so that sometimes they can be almost garish, but other times they work very well seen side by side. They make the image more bright. Just, I don't know. They do something to the eyes. Um, but they can also be mixed together. And we'll talk about that too, to help cancel one, and one another out. So if you want to take a red, make it a little more naturalistic looking, take some of that vibrancy out of the hue, you add some green to it and it can do something, it can start to turn it more into like a gray. So here are those colors seen side by side, and you can notice how just, you know, absolutely strong those colors appear. Yellow and violet, orange and blue, red and green. And remember too, it's not just the primaries and secondaries. If you shift in this direction, say you start to go towards a yellowish green, the opposite on the color wheel then would be a color like this. Okay, 
a reddish violet, right? Or if you have reddish orange, then the opposite of that would be over here. And you have something that's somewhere between a blue and a green, bluish green. Now, this is a strange phenomenon. It actually has like a physical presence and it does something to our eyes for more than one reason. But maybe when I explain this to you, you could take a second to just stare into the middle of this orange flower and you'll, I'll, I'll observe, I'll, I'll illustrate one of these things that actually happens in, in your eye. First of all, when you have different types of light source, um, let's say you have a bright orange or yellow light, like the kind of light you would get from the sun, particularly imagine being at the beach at sunset, you have kind of this orangish, peachy colored light coming down, right? If you notice the shadows that are being cast, they have a bluish to violet cast to them. They're a different color. It's strange. It's almost like they're the complementary opposite of the type of light that's being shown. In another example, you could go into, let's say you go into a um, industrial bathroom or somewhere with strong fluorescent lighting or something. If you look down and notice, you'll see that the the shadows actually have an orange to reddish hue. They're they're quite different. It's really kind of interesting and strange. And another example of this, and this is a, from a personal antidote that I realized when I was younger. At one time, my parents took me on a skiing trip, and for the day, I wore amber-colored goggles. You know, the sort of orange lens goggles that help cut glare. And I spent the whole day in them. You know, not really thinking about it, just cruising around and by the end of the day, exhausted, done, I took those goggles off and lo and behold, everything looked blue. The snow looked blue. It was the craziest thing. It's, it's something that has to do with how your eyes want to rest on the complementary opposite color. So if you're, if you're being assaulted by the color orange and then you, as soon as you take that away, then what you see is blue. It's it's a strange thing. And then until your eyes sort of neutral, neutralize or whatever. Now this is something that artists have just realized. They I don't know how they discovered it, but you know, just over time it, it became a realization and, and they started using it in their paintings as a way to kind of enhance them and make them more, I don't know, appealing to look at. So here we have Van Gogh, and you can see that the complementary color combination here is sort of a green with reds. Another Van Gogh in this piece. Can you tell what the color complements are? We see orange over here in the dirt. And so there's blues in the water and other places. But there's also yellow in these bricks. And the complementary opposite of yellow is purple. So you see that in the shadows and also on some of the face of these bricks here as well. It's kind of neat, it starts to become like a game. Here's another uh, Van Gogh painting. You have blue in the walls, and all the wood furniture in here is pretty much sort of orange colors. The orange bed and the frames around the paintings. And you have this red comforter or blanket, and then on the floor there's all this green. Those colors just seem to work well together. And they don't always have to be as obvious. Sometimes they're a little more neutral. In this particular case, you know, this is a Cezanne, and you have sort of these muted greens, sort of greenish blues in the background. And then you also have these blues down here and a, a tiny bit of violet. So all those colors. And what do you find in the fruit? You find oranges, red, and yellows. All colors that seem to kind of balance and help, I don't know, complement exactly why they're called complementary colors, the colors in the background. And this one, this one's quite exciting. There's all kinds of things going on. And I mean, that's something to talk about. It's just color is crazy. Just in the same way that you, as an artist, start to train yourself to, to observe and I don't know, record the different subtle variations in light and dark, like as you do in drawing and in value, or you're in your black and white monochromatic painting. 
you start to have to observe the subtleties of color in these in 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 the still lives that you're looking at. So here you know you have a yellow piece of chalk pastel and there's there's purple in the shadow here in cast. Down here you have a green pastel and there's little hints of red in it. Over here, same thing, another green pastel and there's little little flecks of red just kind of poking out, just making this more vibrant. How about this yellow pastel? You see the slight green cast of the shadow on this side? And then over here, or the green of the light on this side, and then the, there's like a red cast on that side of the pastel. It just makes you look more closely and you start to see these things that, that are quite cool. And there's a little bit of a green cast on the side of this blue pastel and there's some red over here, so those are complements. Just making them more vibrant. Now, as I said, this becomes not just as a theme for, I don't know, creating, oh, I don't know, creating color compositions, but complementary opposites do something for you as well, as far as mixing. And if, I don't know if you're taking notes, but this might be something that you would like to write down because I'll give you a couple of names here. Um, in theory, with subtractive color mixing, if you take a color such as yellow and you have the opposite, a purple violet or something, and you add them together in increments, eventually you can find a balance where those two colors will naturally neutralize each other and become what is known as a chromatic gray. And those are preferable. Chromatic grays are preferable than say, you know, a gray made from black and white mixed together. Black and white tend to be a little muddy and sometimes they, they take away from the color, but if you can create grays that are made from color, they tend to work much better. And so those are preferable than just um, uh, mixing one with the black and white tubes of paint. Another one is orange and blue, and of course, red and green. Now, from personal experience, um, there's two colors. It's, it's often hard to find perfectly opposite matched tubes of paint where you get colors that are exactly the opposite of each other in the color wheel. Oftentimes you mix two complements together and you might get start getting close to a gray, but it might end up being more of a tan or a brown or, or something that's a little more muddy. But I know that if you get cadmium red light, which is actually an orange color, and thalo blue, which is you know a blue color with maybe just a hint of green, this has a hint of red, they tend to be actual true opposites. And that was something I discovered, you know, early on in school. And those two colors together make a really nice, almost chromatic dark gray black, which then when thinned out and glazing becomes this, this nice universal glaze. It's, it's, it works well in so many situations because if you need that glaze to be a little warmer, you just add a little extra of the cadmium red light if you need that glaze to be a little cooler, say you're glazing over the top of warm colors, you can add a little bit more of the phthalo. And, and so it's kind of a, a nice universal color that you can get. Of course, cadmium red light is a very expensive colored tube of paint, so you're not required to get it. However, you know, if this is something that you like to do, you might consider getting those two colors for those reasons. And another one that I, I used to use oftentimes was Azalean crimson um, and raw umber. Raw umber is a very sort of natural looking greenish hue. And those two together, I would just add a little bit of the Azalean, I'm sorry, a little bit of the raw umber into the Azalean and it would just enrich in it, make it a deeper red. Um, just kind of more, oh, I don't know. It was just to order my taste for uh, some of the things that I wanted to use it for. So I don't know, those are just some thoughts. Another one I discovered for the old master technique and these two colors work really well together. Um, burnt sienna, which is a reddish brown. Okay, of course it's, it's more of a natural color. 
pairs really nicely with raw umber. So when looking for those complementary color opposites or using them as your as an artist, it's not always wise to make them really obvious. I mean, the, you know, the point isn't necessarily to make your paintings overly, overly the top, you know, red and green, super bright to the point of it's melting people's eyes off, right? So you can take those colors and neutralize them a little bit. And so you see in this painting, the colors have been a little bit more neutralized. This, this purple here isn't so harsh and it pairs nicely with the yellow and the guitar. You have kind of this reddish brown up here, and it's complemented by the green of the pants. So it's not always really, really obvious, but for you as artists that you're aware of, now that you're aware of this concept, you can start making a game out of it, looking at how painters have used it in a lot of the paintings that you see. Now, of course, that is not the only type of color scheme that artists use. There's lots of different other ones. One of the most uh, obvious ones is called the... Uh, primary color scheme. Here's one from Mondrian. It's obviously just red, yellow, and blue, right? But you also find that one oftentimes in older paintings, um, religious paintings in particular. I'm not exactly sure why, I can't remember, but um, you have these reds, blues, and yellows, right? Primary colors. But you also notice in this one, they're complemented. There's a little bit of violet in this, this covering on this guy's head. This blue is complemented nicely by the orange tunic, of this fellow right over here. And the red is complemented by some of the greens in this person's garment. It's very much like they were trying to get your attention, I think, trying to make people look at this iconography. Um, in the same way that uh, manufacturers use um, primary and secondary colors to advertise their cereal on the, you know, in the grocery store shelves. Those colors are, are grabbing and, you know, they grab your attention. Another color scheme is called analogous, and those are colors that happen more closely together on the color wheel. So rather than having opposites, the colors seem to be kind of bunched up on one side of the color wheel. Here you have one with a bunch of the warm colors or colors that are in the cool range, greens and blues or greenish yellows, that sort of thing. Now it's, it's advisable, especially in oil painting, I think. The only exception to this would be if you were, if you were using watercolor, um, you wouldn't like to use the white of the page to help give luminosity to your transparent pigments. But when it comes to oil painting, acrylic painting, that sort of thing, where you're, you're putting down more opaque layers, it's, a, it's advisable to tone or stain your canvas first. And oftentimes, colors that are used are, this is burnt sienna. It gives a nice kind of warmish, you know, red tone that you can work on top of. And that way, when you lay your brush strokes down and you know, there might be the possibility of a little bit of the canvas popping through here or there, you miss a spot or intentionally leave spots popping out. You get this nice color added rather than just the harshness of the white. White and black are, are colors you kind of want to avoid a little bit if, if you can help it. Oftentimes they, they ruin colors. And so just adding a layer of color is better. So you'll notice that here on this um, Toulouse-Lautrec. Down here you have the yellow of the ground that he's painting on top of, or working on top of, rather. Okay, And it's nice because it's kind of complemented by the violets and these shadows and all, along this um, woman's arm. You see that there. And then you also get a complementary set of green over here and red over here. But because they're put on so transparently, there's some optical mixing going on. And optical mis mixing means that if you put a more transparent layer on and the color from underneath also comes through, it affects one another. As if putting two planes of stained glass together of different colors, they start to create like a, a, a blending that happens naturally. So this one looks a little more like a, you know, instead of red, a little more orangey because of the yellow mixing. And this green over here is a little more of a yellowish green because of the optical mixing going on.
interesting. Um, the sort of color you tone your ground or stain your ground is totally dependent on, you know, it's up to you. Some people use really bright colors. This is Sean Griggs out in Ferndale. He often uses this really bright red color underneath his paintings. And it sort of complements his landscapes. He often does things at the beach or, or things in nature. And as you can see here in these the green foliage and Oh, and the under canopy, you get these little hints of the red coming through still. Right here on the edge of the building, over here in these plants, little hints of that red color popping through his painting. And it just makes it more exciting, complements the greens, and, and, and just makes everything more lively to look at. Here's another local painter, uh, Erica Brooks. You can see her painting set up at home, which is kind of nice. Here's what's kind of like a shadow box. So if you have the inability to sort of keep sunlight off of your still life, maybe you don't have enough blankets to cover your windows or you're just you're in a situation where that doesn't work, you could build yourself a box like this, which helps protect the still life from that unwanted, still, unwanted sun. And then you can have more control over what, what's happening with the lighting on your still life. But back to the point, notice the, it looks like yellow ochre is a very common color to put down to start. You can see little hints of that coming through her painting. And then she painted the blues once that dried over the top. And so when you get little hints of it coming through, places where the blue is a little thin or didn't even get put on all the way at all, you get little hints of this color coming through, which is much nicer than just stark white. Um, this is a copy of, uh, a student copy of, I think they were called the California painters. I'm not sure what the artist was for this one, but, um, this one, there was a bright orange put down first, which great, you know, that, that tends to really help and make this more visually stimulating when you see the greens and the blues, the greens and the blues are complemented by the reddish orange. It's kind of a, you know, split between the split, the difference complementary color. But imagine this painting, to make the point, imagine this painting without that orange color. If it was just the blue and the white and the gray and the greens, it would look a lot more muddy. It, it would lack something and seem kind of dull. So back to the point of creating values or with color tones, let's take a look at the idea of what an underpainting can do for you. And I think I showed that to you in my demo for the, our last painting. But let's say you're going to tone, stain your canvas with something like burnt sienna. I'll say that again. That's a very common one. Yellow ochre and burnt sienna are very common. You can lay it down in such a way, almost like a watercolor, in washes, and try to start capturing the different tonal values that you see in the very first layer, here's a couple of different versions where they've attempted it different ways. Trying to show the shadows, trying to show where the lights are versus the darks. So you start getting that information there prior to putting down your more expensive colors. In fact, this was a common practice in a lot of like, oh, old Renaissance painting shops. They would often do what was called like a grisaille, a, a, just a tonal version of a painting and they would show it and hang it in their shop and when clients would come in they would see one that they would like and they would say that looks great you know i love i love how it looks can you now finish it in color for me because the shop didn't want to waste their really expensive expensive paints and pigments on a painting and unless they knew it was already sold and strangely enough, seeing it in black and white was good enough for the client. They knew it was going to be good based on those qualities. So just another example, you know, just of how you can just paint and draw in those early stages. And now finally, let's talk about um, another couple of painting terms or color terms. And that is what is referred to as perceived color versus local color. So local color 
is the color that something is. So for example, my walls are blue, um, my shirt is black, my hat is blue. It's just, those are the colors that those things are and they exist undependent of lighting. Perceived color, however, is how those colors look in different sorts of light because lighting changes how you see things. And the easiest example of that would be, I don't know if you've ever been to a club with black lights, but if you wear a white t-shirt into there, you go into the black light room and I don't know, your shirt is glowing sort of neon bluish purple. It's, you know, it's, it's a different color because of the light that is perceived color. So how do we break down what we see in real life with those things? Well, I mean, first of all, a lot of it's just going to be you looking closely and trying to see what tones are there. I'm sorry, hues. But let's just kind of break it down here in this, this build up. So in the background, this photograph, we'll pretend this is real life. You see the sort of hazy blue of the of the of the background, the way things look hazy and, and atmospherically bluer as they go further away. Then you have this big valley here, and it's sort of bathed in natural light. And then you have cinder blocks or some sort of stone blocks. We'll say they're concrete, and you know they're probably a gray color. Of some sort, you know, maybe with a little bit of brownish, uh, I don't know, moldy crud on the side. Here, you know, we have sort of an underpainting that's banking a lot on the perceived light. So the blues back here that show that atmospheric bluing that's happening. A lot of yellows and reds that are happening here in the valley because of the yellow sunlight or yellows and oranges rather and then remember what i said about at the beach and how you get almost complementary opposite shadows notice the shadows on the side of these cinder blocks have a violet tone interesting right and then the next step would be laying in your your um, local colors. So the grass is green. You have greens here, but you have little flecks of yellow coming through from the first layer. They haven't really put much green down here, but you know, then they added the greens of the trees back here, but they have much, a much more bluish tone to them than say the greens up here because of that background atmospheric. And then the cinder blocks, you know, they've added the sort of gray of the concrete color to give it that texture and its local color, yet you still see the hints of the violet coming through and the yellow coming through from the light. So these seems like they're, they're informed by both local color and perceived color. So let's take a look at just a few student examples and we can kind of pick them apart and talk about, you know, here in the background, they laid a wash of probably Indian yellow or yellow ochre, more likely, just very thin. Yellow is a good color to use as a ground oftentimes because it's the color that is most easily adulterated. It doesn't take much to kind of dirty up a yellow. If you put it down on the nice clean white canvas uh, before you begin, oftentimes you can try to keep it, leave it alone and it ends up staying nice and yellow and, and translucent. Otherwise you have to grab some sort of opaque yellow and try to glob it on but these are more luminous oftentimes. Then you have the blue of the bottles complemented by the oranges. Here you have a nice red shadow on the back of this orange complemented by this green. Then you have this red onion back here, which is more violet than red, right? Because of the color of the skin and it complements by the yellow background. Also notice, look at these shadows. They're not black. There is a lot of a cool color in them. It's, it's the sort of the opposite, the warm color back here. The light is complemented by the cooler colored shadows that are here. And even this little strip of green fabric or whatever it is on the tabletop has a tiny hint of red 
right next to it at its base, sort of the complement of the color of the fabric. Okay, here's another student's um, piece from this color assignment. Uh, we have kind of a bluish violet bottle over here. It's got some blues and violet. Uh, oranges, we have a yellow background that seems to complement the violets in here. The oranges uh, complement the blues in the bottle. They also complement the blues of the, of the ground that they're sitting on. But really, I wanted to show you this painting for the sake of talking about reflected color. Because just like there's light that gets reflected around um, when you're looking at something, let's say when you were doing your monochromatic painting or you were doing a value drawing of some point in your life, and you're really starting to become sensitive to the way that light reflects, you will want to start looking at the way color bounces off one another. So the way, most obviously, these oranges being reflected in this glass and how that color gets shifted because of the reason it's being reflected in a bluish violet glass, it kind of changes its hue. But even the, the blue of this ground kind of affects some of the reflections and some of the colors that are down here. It's kind of cool. But most mostly in this one, I just love these shadows. Look at how many colors are actually in these shadows. When they made the glazes to create these shadows, they really got they, they really looked at the different types of colors they were seeing in the hues of the shadows. I don't know. I'm a big fan of shadows for some reason. I always have been. And when I see artists, you know, picking them apart and really displaying them in interesting ways, it just makes me want to look closer. Now, this particular artist did, um, she's working in acrylic. She's doing like, she did several smaller studies, which was okay for me. Like I decided, well, you know, if you're going to do small ones, you do more than one. And it was a way for her to experiment more. And just look how jewel-like these oranges appear. It's very, very, um, oh, I don't know, just vibrant because of the, the blues here versus the oranges here versus these really just almost reddish, reddish orange uh, shadows or deeper parts of the oranges versus the green of the tabletop it just they they're jewel like they're very they're very almost like candy or something i don't know just bright to your eyes and this one also really good i feel like it's not quite as balanced it's it's almost more like an analogous color scheme because of how yellow this green is and the reds and the yellows and the oranges the only thing that kind of breaks that up is the blue of the bottle but i almost feel like this one could have been pushed further however Still another, you know, just a bright painting and very, very exciting, lively. And this one is much more subtle, looks more like a, oh, I don't know, Flemish uh, still life. You know, you have very subtle browns and this kind of neutral green. But these are compliments too. Notice how there's reds in these red onions. There's red colors. But there's also violets in there purples because of the way the skins are so deep in these um, red onions they kind of have a violet hue and that complements the yellow ochre of this vessel and here we have a fig that's quite purple so that that also helps kind of complement it as well but so you have these very subtle complements that you wouldn't maybe necessarily notice that, that was what the artist was doing especially if you were a non-artist you would have no idea but now that you guys are in the know and you realize that this is a trick that artists use sometimes to enhance their work, you can see that this is what they were doing very subtly in the still life. And another one, this one has a lot of cool optical mixing going on. Um, I'm not exactly sure what color the ground was, but I definitely can tell on this tabletop there was a lot of red or reddish brown that was put down. And then with these layers of bluish green on top, right? The greenish color on top of the red does this weird phenomenon where the green is really thick, it appears green. But where it gets thinner, and you kind of see the combination of the two, it starts to feel like a chromatic gray. It has a more neutralized grayish look to it. I'm not saying it's gray, gray, like straight gray, but you, you see what I mean. There's a more of a gray quality to this area here than there is to over here. 
And then of course, you know, the compliments that we've talked about before, the red in the cup versus the green in the background, these kind of oranges versus the sort of the blues and the bluish green, some blues here, and then violets and yellow. I mean, all that stuff works together, but just another fun example to look at. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to kind of set up your own still life, figure out what you think is going to look cool and just tackle it the way you do. But let's just finish finish um, back here at the color wheel one last time and talk again about mixing color because really this is what this is going to be about. In theory, you know, you could start with just these three colors plus a tube of white and black and you would be able to do 90% of all the things that you would ever want to do in painting. Of course, that would be very time consuming. It would be hard if every single time you needed an orange or a purple you had to mix your reds and blues in the perfect combination. And sometimes, you know, time is money. It might be better just to buy a tube of dioxazine purple to have at your disposal. But the idea is that, you know, if you need a green, you can just mix these two together. Or say if you already have a green and the vessel or the object or the fruit or the vegetable or whatever it is that you're trying to match, needs to be a different green than the one that's straight out of your tube of paint, that's when you need to you know, practice mixing. Shifting that color, making it more blue, adding blue to it, making it more yellow, adding yellow to it, taking a yellow and making it more orange by adding red, or deepening a yellow, making it slightly darker or more golden. Guess how you do that? Tiny bit of violet just the smallest amount and it'll make this more golden. Never add black to yellow to make it darker. It'll turn it to garbage. All right. So I don't know, get your color wheels out. Think about mixing color, trying to see the subtle shifts between, between tones and the ideas that you're going to try to match the colors that you see in real life in the same way that you match light and shadow. You can always add white to a color to lighten it. That is, that is a possibility. Or you can try to thin it out with glaze to make it more thin and transparent. But that doesn't necessarily work if you're working one opaque color over the other. You might need to add white. It will take away some of the vibrancy of the hue because you know white tends to muddy. But at the same time, the white will lighten a color. So if you have a very dark blue and you need to make it lighter, obviously you have to add white to it to make that happen. Okay, 